She knew that he was up to something, but no one listened. A few hours later, she was brutally murdered. The 25th of January, 2023 gave the start to what has been dubbed South Carolina's trial of the century. Family mysteries, fraud, embezzlement, and murder are just some of the things that have been revealed in the ongoing Murdaugh trials. And there is even more left to uncover. Alex Murdaugh was born into South Carolina's law dynasty. His family's law firm dated back to 1910, with each generation of Murdaugh men becoming lawyers and taking the places of their elders. The law was deeply ingrained into his childhood, mentality, and way of life, or at least that's how it seemed on the surface. But what lay beyond Murdaugh's family man demeanor was beyond what anyone could have imagined. Trouble seemed to follow Alex. Just two years prior to the tragedy surrounding his family, his son, Paul Murdaugh, was involved in a boating accident that resulted in the death of 19-year-old Mallory Beach. Paul seemed to have a bit of an addictive personality just like his father. And in a drunken stupor, after a night of partying, he decided to operate his father's boat. Paul's incident cast a shadow over the Murdaugh family. They hated Paul Murdoch, and they had anger in their heart. After all, they were well-known members of their community, and the law firm had been an integral part of their district's justice system for many years. But what Paul did would fade in comparison to what happened on the night of the 7th of June, 2021. Curious? At the Decoder, we put together case files from all available sources in order to present you with the most truthful version of events. Your support keeps us going, so make sure that you hit the like button and watch the rest of our videos. On the evening of the 7th of June, 2021, Paul Murdaugh was attending to Moselle, the 1,700-acre property that Alex said was his son's biggest passion. That fateful night, his father was to decide that young Paul was never to leave that place again. Paul and his father were driving around the property at around 7 p.m., looking at the trees they had planted. At 7.38 p.m., Paul took a Snapchat video of him and Alex laughing at some crooked trees on the property. <laughs> a seemingly innocent gesture, which he thought would make a fun memory of time spent with his father. Later, however, it would end up being used as evidence, placing Murdaugh at the scene of a horrendous crime. They arrived back at the main house at around 8 p.m., where they had dinner with an uneasy Maggie Murdaugh. Murdaugh's estranged wife had been hesitant to go to the property that night, having texted a friend about Alex's fishy behavior and her suspicion that he was up to something. At 8.22 p.m., three different apps on Paul's phone place him at the dog's kennel on the property, the same spot where the shootings were about to take place. Paul was texting his friends around that same time and tending to the dogs. In the meantime, Maggie and Alex were talking by the truck, or as evidence suggests, having one final argument. Murdaugh's anxiety was ramping up as the perfect opportunity for his plan was drawing nearer. At 8.44 p.m., Paul made another Snapchat video in which everyone's voices can be heard, cementing Alex's presence at the scene of the crime. Hey, he's got a bird in his mouth! Bubba. Hey, Bubba. It's a guinea. This is a chicken. Come here, Bubba. Come here, Cash. Come here, Bubba. Cash. Quit. In the meantime, Alex equipped himself with a blue raincoat, which would protect his clothes from any blood and his guns from any rain. It is believed that Alex later changed into a new set of clothes. As Paul looked down at his phone, his father walked up to him and shot him in the chest. He then came closer and shot him in the head. Maggie entered survival mode and tried to make a run for it as Alex grabbed his second gun and shot her five times. The bloody, vile scene of the Murdaugh family murders is now set. Paul is lying face down with his brains blown out by the second close-range shot. Maggie, who had tried to run, is also face down, having been hit in the back of the head. 
Alex took a look at his work and then proceeded to wash off his blue jacket, leaving behind puddles of blood mixed with water. At 8.55 p.m., Maggie's phone was activated in spite of her death. This was one of Alex's slip-ups, who had taken her phone and accidentally turned it on. He grabbed the car keys from Paul's pocket, leaving a blood stain inside. By 8.58 p.m., Alex had arrived back at the main house. By 9.02 p.m., Alex had walked 283 steps, pacing anxiously back and forth as he tried to calm himself down. He made a call and texted his wife's phone, two actions which would later make up part of his alibi. He then dropped Maggie's phone on the side of the road as he drove away from the family property. Alex then drove to his mother's home where he stayed for 20 minutes. He told his mother's carer, however, to say he spent 40 minutes there instead, since if that were true, it would have been impossible to place Murdaugh at the crime scene. Murdaugh got back to Moselle at around 10 p.m., and at 10.07, he made the 911 call announcing Paul and Maggie's deaths. Authorities arrived at the crime scene at 10.26 p.m. Following the authorities' assessment of the crime scene, Alex was asked for an interview by one of the officers. The following analysis looks into Murdaugh's body language and behavior during this interview. Watch out for what he is saying, and even more importantly, watch for the things he chooses not to say. And a good phone number for you. 803-942-1223. Right off the bat, we can notice Murdaugh's sniffling getting increasingly louder as the officer starts asking questions. He wants his emotional response to be noticed, from his voice occasionally cracking to his sniffling and constant blinking. He wants to show that he has been crying. And sir, what was your name? Yeah, Danny Henderson. Okay. All right. Murdaugh stares blankly into space. There's no way to tell whether he is doing this on purpose or not, but we know that he noticed and directly looked into the camera as it was turned on. So there's a possibility that Murdaugh is aiming to appear more distraught or dissociated than he actually is. Him. And, you know, I knew something was bad. I ran out. I knew it was really bad. <laughs> my, my boy over there, I could see. As the officer apologizes for having to interview Murdaugh right after the discovery of his deceased family, Murdaugh enthusiastically says, don't worry, and proceeds to tell his point of view. Murdaugh launches into his story, taking care to heighten the tremor and effect in his voice in the process, all without actually shedding a single tear. <laughs> Sorry. And I could see his brain on his... <laughs> Murdaugh's breakdown at this point in the interview seems genuine. He is speaking about his son, who is believed to have been more of a collateral victim in Murdaugh's crime, his estranged wife being the main target. However, Murdaugh's return to a composed state is uncanny for someone who has just found their murdered son and wife, as is his ability to offer details. Um, then I went to my wife, and I, I mean, I could see. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Did you touch Maggie at all? I did. I touched them both. Okay. I tried to take, I mean, I tried to do it as limited as possible, mm -hmm. but I, I tried to take their pulse on both of them. Mm -hmm. Here, we can notice Murdaugh's lesser reaction to his wife's death, which highly contrasts his previous reaction to finding his son's body. 
had Maggie and Paul been arguing over anything? No. What was their relationship like? Wonderful. Wonderful. How about yours and Maggie's? Wonderful. I mean, I'm sure we had little things here and there, but we had a wonderful marriage, mm -hmm. wonderful relationship. <laughs> Further to his previous reaction, we can notice Murdaugh hesitate right after he says that his relationship with Maggie, his estranged wife, was wonderful. He then admitted that they had had their issues. But even that is an understatement of the things that have been going wrong in their marriage. In hindsight, it is clear that Murdaugh was playing up his relationship with Maggie, who we know was hesitant to see him in order to ramp up his performance. In reality, Maggie had been living separately from Alex and had been reluctant to come see him on the property that night. In yours and Paul's relationship? As good as it could be. How old was Paul? 22. Okay. As the now hesitant officer keeps nodding his head at Murdaugh's claims regarding his relationship with his wife, we see Alex look at the officer from under a furrowed brow. The officer does not make eye contact, but Murdaugh continues looking. This suggests that Murdaugh wants to assure the officer that he is telling the truth by initiating eye contact. Moreover, as the officer moves on with his questions, we can see Murdaugh still staring at him, expressionlessly assessing him, making us wonder, did Murdaugh know he was being treated as a suspect? It is likely that he did not, or not at this point in the investigation. What is clear from Murdaugh's behavior during the interview is that he is anxious, and that his anxiety is heightened whenever he is required to answer questions about that night. Has he received any direct threats related to the boat accident? Oh, yes. All the time he Re gets threats. Recently? Um, yes, sir. I mean, he gets them all the time. Okay. He gets them all the time. <clears throat> Once again, we can notice Murdaugh looking at the officer for a prolonged period after offering an answer. This pattern of behavior suggests that Murdaugh is assessing the officer's reaction for clues as to whether he's being believed or not. So is there anybody that you can think of that we need to talk to tonight? Is there a name that comes to mind? I mean, I can't tell you anybody that I'm overly suspicious of off the top of my head okay. you know um, I mean this is such a stupid thing I'm even embarrassed to say it but it just didn't make any sense I just hired a guy out here mm -hmm. and he really he wasn't cutting the mustard but I hadn't told him this yet Murda is once again constantly looking at the officer to gauge his reaction as he proceeds to list the people he is suspicious of, right after saying there's no one he's overly suspicious of. As he continues cushioning his following list with remarks of how stupid his suggestions are, we can notice the officer just nodding along, probably knowing that Murda had prepared this list before he was asked. He killed the sunflower seeds in our dove field just recently, which is why Paul was here doing this. He told Paul a story the other day about how when he was in high school, he got in a fight with some black guys. And the FBI undercover team observed him fighting those guys and put him on an undercover team with three Navy SEALs. And that their job was to kill radical black panthers. And they did that from Myrtle Beach to Savannah. Now, I really don't think this guy, you know, mm -hmm. is probably the person, but that's just so freaking. Yeah, that's kind of far-fetched story. It's weird, but he was off today. Okay. He took his daddy to the doctor. What's his name? C.B. Rowe. Murdaugh proceeds to disclose the story of the man he had hired to work on his grounds, who he claims could have a history of working with Navy SEALs for the government. This story had clearly been prepared for this moment. Murdaugh is able to give details regarding a man he barely knows, which especially in his supposedly distraught condition is highly unusual. Do y'all store any weapons out here? 
Um, we don't store them, but they're, you know, they're frequently out here. Mm -hmm. I need to find out if there were any out here because I know there was a shotgun. There was a 12 gauge shotgun out here. Uh, <coughs> I'll have to find out exactly when that was. I think it got put up, but I'm not positive. What did that shotgun look like? Uh, it was, a. Uh, Camouflage. Um, I, I want to say it was a Benelli or maybe a Beretta. I can't remember which brand it is. Murda is able to give extensive, detailed descriptions of one of the guns used in the killings, which he suggests was not stored on the property, but that could have been around at the time of the murders. Once again, offering this level of detail and making up potential reasons why the shotgun would have been on the property, even though it is not normally stored there, confirm Murdaugh with an uncanny behavior considering his situation. But I don't think it was out here. Okay. Recently. But I'm not positive. Murdaugh adds that he does not think the shotgun was there, but that he's not sure of that all the while staring at the officer, engaging his reactions in the same manner as before. Murdaugh is saying anything and everything that could potentially cover him in case details which question his testimony come out. This aspect of wanting to constantly reassure the officer with regard to what he does and does not know for sure is a marker of anxiety in Murdaugh. He is trying to cover everything that an innocent party would not know, and in his case, this is proving difficult at times. What did you do today? Were you at the office or? No, nope, I was home. I came home. Paul and I messed around. I, I, uh, I was up at the house. I laid down, took a nap on the couch, probably, I don't know, 25, 30 minutes. I got up. I called Maggie. Didn't get an answer. And... I left to go to my mom's. She had said she might ride with me, but she normally doesn't when I go over there. When asked about his day, Murdaugh did not spend a single moment thinking about what he had done. He immediately started listing the events of his day in detail, which suggests that he had planned his answer. In fact, it is almost as if he had scripted his day before it had even started. What's another number in case I can't get you on your cell? I don't have a house phone. Okay. Um, my office number. I can give you my brother's cell phones. As the officer announces they will have more questions and Murdaugh states his availability, we can notice him staring down at the officer's paperwork. It is no surprise that Murdaugh would want to know what was going on behind the scenes at this point in the investigation and whether he was being considered a suspect or not. Everyone reacts differently to shock, and whether someone cries is rarely an indicator of whether they are faking emotion or not. But in Murdaugh's case, what we can definitely observe as suspicious are his multiple switches between a very composed and articulate state to sobbing, or the other way around. This kind of emotional switch is highly uncanny, and combined with Murdaugh's ability to offer detailed answers to the officer's specific questions in spite of his supposed mental state is strange, to say the least. Moreover, faking emotion takes effort, and we can observe Murdaugh simply dropping his sobbing after he laments Paul, and once again toward the end of the interview. Amongst the mountains of evidence that authorities claim they have collected against Murdaugh are the blue jacket Alex wore on the night of the murders, which is full of gunshot residue. Bullet casings and empty ammunition boxes matching the weapons used in the murders were also found on the Murdaugh property. Curiously enough, in completely different places from where the murders had taken place. Moreover, the evidence recorded on Paul's cell phone, such as the video of him and his father earlier on the evening of the 7th, as well as a video of one of their dogs placing Alex at the scene around the time of the murders, were found to contradict some of Murdaugh's earlier claims and alibi. But the question on everyone's minds, even on the minds of those suspicious of Alex, is why? Why would he kill his son and his wife? 
The answer to this question is almost more disturbing than the murders themselves. It has been revealed that Alex Murdaugh had been embezzling funds from his family's law firm for years. So it is believed that he took the lives of Paul and Maggie in an attempt to garner sympathy from the public and direct attention away from his scandal coming out. In fact, it was revealed that Murdaugh had been approached by the CFO of his law firm about missing money on the very morning of the murders. But in September 2021, Alex was confronted by members of the law firm over $1 million of funds which had gone missing. The very next day after this confrontation, Alex Murdaugh was shot in the head whilst changing a tire. His wounds, however, were superficial. After recovering from his shooting, Murdaugh bought himself some more time by entering rehab. As more information surrounding Alex's embezzlement started coming to light, Murdaugh decided to resign from his family's law firm, and his lawyer's license was later revoked by authorities. On the 15th of September 2021, yet another shocking discovery was made in the Murdaugh case, once again evidencing Alex's cunning, cold nature. It was revealed that Alex had hired a hitman to shoot him, by the name of Curtis Edward Smith in order for his surviving son, Buster, to receive $10 million in life insurance. Murdaugh himself provided Smith with a weapon and directed him to shoot him in the head. It was only after multiple other indictments, including misappropriation of funds and embezzlement, that Murdaugh was charged with the murders of his wife and son. Alex Murdaugh is currently undergoing trial and is pleading not guilty on all charges regarding the events on the 7th of June, 2021. Did this video answer your questions about the Murdaugh case? What did you think of Alex's behavior during the interrogation? Let us know what you think in the comments below. Your support keeps us going, so make sure you show our other videos some love if you enjoyed this one. And we'll see you next time on the decoder.